Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. In financial advice, CX expectations are especially profound. Market and regulatory forces have already and rightly set a high benchmark for customised and client-centric services. So, in an environment where clients have an abundance of tailored services to choose from, having a powerful client experience strategy is a critical differentiator. Learn how Exceptional CX delivers business growth. Download the guide at macquarie.com.au forward slash client hyphen experience. Hello and welcome to the XY Topics Podcast. My name is Fraser Jack. Now, I love peer-to-peer learning and there's nothing better to us here at XY Advisor than advisors helping each other grow. One of the top peer-to-peer learning communities has been Macquarie Virtual Advisor Network, otherwise known as Macquarie Van, a group of high-performing businesses that wanted to take their success to the next level. And there's plenty of success stories that have come out of that community. But most of what happened inside Van stayed inside Van, until now that is. In this podcast, I'm very excited to be able to open up the vault and chat with Shan Chung, who has been working with these professional practices for over 10 years. Shan is the Client Development Manager, an Associate Director and a Business Coach, Facilitator and Strategist who helps businesses find clarity. He specializes in strategy execution, change management, client experience, organic growth, and mergers and acquisitions. Our conversation went into detail about the first two of four pillars that the program is built on, and Sean shares so many great resources. You'll want to take notes along the way. We cover everything from formulating your business strategy, making better decisions and executing successfully, to designing your client experience. So if you want to know how high-performing businesses are already doing this, then this episode is for you. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Thank you, Fraser. Thanks for having me. It's, it's fantastic to, to have you along. I'm really looking forward to this podcast. There's some uh, incredibly amazing content. I've had a, I've had a sneak peek uh, to go through, so I'm looking forward to, to getting into that. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about you. Sure, sure. So, um, Sean Chung, been at Macquarie Bank for about 15 years, uh, always connected to the advice industry, so quite passionate about advice. And for the last 10 years, been with the Virtual Advisor Network. Uh, and in that role, been working with advisory firms, so that includes accounting and financial planning, ranging in size from 1 million revenue to 50 million revenue, and seen a lot of them grow through that, that range, which has been really interesting. And my role has been to uh, help them formulate and then execute strategy and succeed in where they want to go. And then the other part has been the community side, so bringing them together to share ideas at conferences and roundtables and so on. Yes, exactly right. And all the ideas and concepts that you would have seen over the time would be, uh, I think, are going to be invaluable to the listeners listening to this. So thank you so much for coming along and, and being prepared to talk about that. Tell us a little bit about the, the successful advice framework itself um, within the uh, Macquarie Virtual Advisor Network. Yeah, sure. So um, over that 10 years that we've been operating Van, we thought, look, we've seen a lot of what actually works and doesn't work. We've also condensed and and tailored a lot of good business practices for advisory firms of that size. So we thought it was a good time to, to start to package that up in a framework that an advice practice could uh, really practically use in their business and, and think about their business, you know, a tool to think about their business. So um, we've combined, you know, leading global practices, tailored them to businesses of this size, uh, and and also some of those real world insights, as I mentioned. Um, and the re- yeah. one of the reasons we did that is we found that, you know, advisors go through a, a growth stage from, from being a, a great advisor to becoming a business leader and a, and a business owner, which is a different skill set. So this is a way of, of equipping them with that transition. Yeah, amazing. I love I love the concept of taking uh, all that wisdom and knowledge and those um, amazing practices that are in, included in there, and then turning that into a framework. And um, you know, when when you present this framework as such, which is obviously you know got some structure behind it, you're sort of broken up into um, pillars. I think main four main pillars. Um, tell us about those four pillars. 
Yeah, so this is just a, a way to structure it up. As you mentioned, they're not rocket science, but the four pillars are number one is strategy. So making better decisions and then executing well. Second pillar is clients, having a strong differentiated proposition. The third pillar is scale and growth, having a great operating model. And the fourth one is people and culture. So you could apply those four pillars to any business really, but it's just a good way to, to group up the topics. And we start with strategy, you know, because you want to know where you're going before you shape those other, other parts. Yeah, and those, those pillars certainly, obviously, we're talking about advice businesses, but they certainly make sense in any business across any industry almost. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Now, today we're really focusing and we're going to go a little bit deeper into pillar one and pillar two, which is which I'm really looking forward to. Um, we're, yeah, let's start with pillar one. We talked about, you know, making uh, better decisions and successfully and uh, those sorts of things. Tell, tell us about pillar one. Sure, sure. So pillar one is all about strategy. Perhaps the, the best way just to, to illuminate this up front is to, to give you a comparison. So I worked with two businesses 10 years ago, uh, and they were both around that mid one mil mark, so 1.3 to 2 mil revenue. 10 years later, one of those businesses was still at about 1.3 mil rev, and the other business was at 20 million rev. So, you know, it just fascinates me. What, what was that second business doing differently? Now, it was a bit of a proviso here. While bigger can be better, I'm not saying that every business should be just growing for the sake of growth or that, you know, the revenue number is the be all and end all. That's not the case. But that smaller business had a lot of frustrations, right? They were having, they had non-standard processes. They were difficulty with staff turnover. They weren't really making the progress they were hoping for. And that fascinated me. You know, what, what were the decisions and the disciplines that that larger business were, were making? to achieve that and break through all those growth ceilings over time. So it's those kinds of that, that thinking that makes that difference that s- sits behind this pillar. Um, and so, you know, what does that actually look like? Well, the, you know, you hear that phrase, work, working on your business, working first working in your business. So it's that on the business thing and it's painting a picture of where you're going. So what, what is that? What does that business look like in five years, 10 years? But really importantly, the less obvious part is how do you connect it to your own personal appetite for for growth, uh, for taking risk to get that growth and for control over your business. Because for, you know, one principle to the next principle, that will change and not the same vision shouldn't apply to every business owner. So it's, a, you know, marrying up your personal goals with, with your business goals. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really very interesting point, isn't it? Because uh, we, we know that our personal goals will often lead and dictate our behaviours. And so if, if they're aligned in the behaviours that the uh, will be in the business will be the same as the, uh, the behaviours at home. Uh, I, I yeah. love this concept. Um, and, and having that clear vision around where you're heading, I think it's, it's great. Um, from a practical point of view, though, what can, what can the advisors listening to this podcast you know, take away as and what are the do's and don'ts that they should be focusing on to, to really you know, double down on that? Yeah, sure. So look, if I was in business, if I had a business partner or several, I would be ensuring that we are all on the same page about where we're going. So taking time out, if you haven't done this already, share your personal goals and your business goals. But, you know, what's driving you? What, what's impacting your thinking over the next few years? What is your appetite for growth, risk and control? Are, are you all aligned on that? Or are there differences that will require some compromise and, and understanding? Um, and that, that openness and understanding of each other is kind of the foundational bedrock of, of everything that comes afterwards, right? Because if there's anything not quite aligned or understood there, and then you, you progress with a certain strategy, it, it may unravel as you realize that your priorities aren't deeply aligned, you know? So start with that. If you're, if you're a sole business owner, just take that time to reflect. If you have trusted peers or advisors or, or staff members, um, just think deeply about that. What is your appetite? The, the environment right now in the advice industry is such that if you've got a big appetite for growth, now's your time, right? So are you going as big as you can or as big as you, you possibly could? Um, you know, and likewise, that, that, that disruption is changing the, the landscape for everyone. So if you, if you would rather have a low sense of control and sort of work less, well, then maybe you can join another larger firm and become part of something bigger, you know, hand over some of that control and go for a good lifestyle. So, you know, there's, there's certainly different options there so long as you're clear on what you want. Yeah, having that, uh, like, like you said, having a clear vision in places is, is pretty important. And as you mentioned there to communicate it, because I think 
I feel like so often there can just be assumptions made, like one business partner just assumes that the other business partner, you know, thinks or feels the same way. Spot on. Yep. And, and I've seen situations where that's come apart 10 years down the track. And yeah, you can imagine the difficulties involved there. We can absolutely imagine that. Now, tell us a little bit about um, the, if, if we chunk down from vision, let's get into a little bit more of the, um, you know, having an action plan in place as well. Cause I, th- I guess it's great to have vision, but then mm. I guess the next step is to start with an action plan. Yes, yeah, spot on. So what, what we recommend business leaders do is apply a management system, which is a very exotic, you know, name. The, uh, the management system developed by Kaplan and Norton, if for those that are curious to read more, uh, theirs is tailored for a large corporation. So w- what we recommend is simplifying it down, but essentially, this is what it looks like, you know. Over a 12-month period, what, what's your rhythm and system for working on your business? And what that should really look like is you start with a strategic view. So what's happening externally and internally in the environment and in our business? Where do we want to take this business? And let's refresh that, right? Let's be clear on where we're going and what success would look like. And then there's a 12-month rhythm of executing to that. So prioritizing what you're going to work on, tracking your progress to that, actually doing the the work. And then 12 months later, you should revisit it, you know. And so it's a regular, disciplined, almost like a drumbeat of of continual working on the business. Um, And that avoids that kind of, oh, we did a strategy day three years ago and we've got a a document in the bottom drawer and you should probably dig it out again, right? It it should always be front of mind, not only where you're going, but the, the measurements along the way and how you're tracking. Yeah, that's really important. Um, you know, having like like you mentioned that disciplined system in place. Um, I really like that. Uh, and you, like like you said, not just having the document in the bottom drawer, but having a system in place where um, you're constantly looking at it and, and becomes part of the BAU. Um, but if we if we chunk down a little bit further as well, what's the practicalities that advisors can start thinking about um, from the actions that they need to 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 create this disciplined system? Sure. So. First of all, it sounds obvious, put it in the diary and commit to it um, so that when things get busy, which they always are, that's sacred. You know, so the firms I've seen do this the best. This is just part of what they do and they never miss it, right? And it's they take it very seriously. They do the pre-work leading up to it. Um, and so just do it really is the, is the, the first practicality. There's another one is, look, we've talked about vision and strategy and that, that all can be a bit fuzzy. So to make it clear, there's a good framework called the playing to win framework from Roger Martin. There's there's hundreds of these frameworks, but that's a good one. Um, and what that gives you is a bit of structure around what that actually looks like. So when we say our strategy, what do we actually mean? Well, it's like, you know, which, which market are we in? Which kinds of clients are we competing for or serving? And how are we actually going to attract those clients better than the next firm or the average firm? And then how will we know we've done it? What does success look like? You know, so that that's where a framework like that can help you get specific rather than just theoretical about your strategy. Yeah, get specific into the actions that are required and who's going to do yeah. what and who's responsible. And um, now I guess if we if we look at that from a, you know, a tracking point of view and, a, and a, you know, looking at key results and um, uh, I want to ask you about the, the OKRs, the objectives and key results um, framework as well and, and, and how mm. advisors can use these things to prioritise what they should be doing first. Sure, sure. So yeah, look, OKRs, many of, um, many of you are listening now would be using those. John Doer, D-O-E-R-R, wrote the book on this. It's just a very practical system, objectives and key results. So what, what I would suggest is once you've developed the strategy, lay out what the key results are. So what, what, how will you know you've, you've succeeded on the way there on a quarterly basis? You know, is it numbers of new clients? Is it client satisfaction scores? Is it, you know, time to produce an SOA, whatever it is, document it and make sure that people know, know who's accountable for what. Um, and in terms of prioritization, you know, this is probably one of the, um, the biggest bang for buck things a business owner can do is, is just simplify their priorities. You know, I've, I've seen, I did ask a business once for their, for their list of current projects and I got a spreadsheet with 72 projects on it. So I think ideally a business, you know, between 500K and and five million revenue should have, say, two headline initiatives, strategic initiatives, give or take. One, one's better, three is okay. 
And that's what everyone's rallying towards, you know, and, and we want to see a return on investment on those projects. We want to see the value delivered to the clients or to the business or to the staff or whatever. Not eight projects, right? Because whoever's working on project number eight is probably better off contributing to project number one, right? Just dump project eight for now. And so the, and a real example of this was we ran a workshop. We talked about this concept and it was music to my ears because one of the firms afterwards said, we've, we just canceled our client seminars. We like doing them. Clients seem to like them, but that was priority number, you know, number 10. Um, so we're going to use that time to embed an acquisition we've just made. And that's, that's brilliant. That's what, you know, so make things simpler for yourself. Try to get a return on those top two before you, you know, expand into the new ones. Easier said than done, but yeah, worth I really do. Absolutely right. I really do think that people will sort of skip that prioritization stage and, uh, and it's such an important part of the, of the puzzle. Um, so when, when we're talking about that, and once we've worked out um, through that prioritization process, what should you know people be thinking about when when trying to execute this and put everything in place? Yeah, sure, sure. So, oh, actually, if I can backtrack a bit, Fraser, there's yeah. for those looking for practical tools, because I'll, I'll, I'll just mention a few tools throughout this chat, just so that if if people want you know a practical take, they can. So there's, there's something called the importance difficulty matrix, very simple prioritization tool. Uh, especially if you're working in a group. So if you just Google importance, difficulty, matrix, just a nice way to to rank your priorities based on the, the d- value they'll deliver to your business and how hard they are to actually to execute. But yeah, um, yeah. so what, once you've got the priorities, how do you get started? Funnily enough, I think the the big one here for business owners is engaging their people. So there's a, two disciplines here, project and change management. And they're kind of, you could think of them as the mechanical and the, the people sides of, of implementing strategy. So I'd recommend just look up um, how you can be a good sponsor of change in a business. Learn the fundamentals, and, it, and it's all about engaging your people, bringing them along the way, So because they'll often be the ones that actually do the work and do the execution. So as the business leader, you want to be flying the flag and helping them and encouraging them, clearing obstacles, making the investment, but they need to be motivated and aligned with you as to why they're doing what they're doing. So to look that up. Um, there's an outfit called ProSci, P-R-O-S-C-I, who have a lot of free resources on, online uh, on leading change. So um, that's that's how I'd recommend executing. It's becoming a great sponsor. That's great. Uh, that's great advice. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, it begins with the staff and the, and the people involved and, and, and the attitudes towards those things. So I think uh, it's great to have some framework and concept around that. That's, that's a really important part once you've, once you've worked out your prioritization. So uh, thanks for that, Sean. So if I was to sort of sum up pillar one on, on, you know, taking notes along the way, it's obviously have a strategy, um, you know, make a plan uh, based on the key results that you need, you know, prioritize it, understand what your measures of success are and, uh, and, and then understanding what those action items required um, might be, and then uh, of course execute the actions required, and and uh, bring people along the way, and um, you know measure the data and and tweak along the way. Um, how important is tracking to you know tweaking the data and t- tracking in the, in this process? Yeah, it's you know what's what's that um, what's that slogan? You know if you you know measure what matters. So what I'd recommend is having a scorecard. If you can have it on one page, that's even better. And I've seen $30 million businesses have their scorecard on one page, right? So um, if anyone's looking for a, a version of that, there's a Vern Harnish who wrote Scaling Up. If you if you Google Scaling Up One Page Plan, what that gives you is something to track to. So all your financial metrics, your goals, your values, um, your OKRs, all in one place so that every quarter or whatever period you decide, you can bring it up and you're updating those measures and, and checking along the way. And, and this is where, to be perfectly frank, strategic execution gets boring, right? It's not exciting to do that. Um, and this is where it is actually a discipline. So it's one of those things you just have to do. And if, if, you, if it doesn't get done for a while, it's one of those things which the wheels won't fall off straight away, but you can veer off course and find yourself a year later, you've, you're on the wrong priorities or you're not sure whether you're making the right progress. So book it in the diary. Try to prioritize it. Um, I can tell you those, those businesses that we've seen grow most rapidly and, and get success have that in place, you know, and they adjust course as they, as they go along. Yeah, really, really important. So, uh, Sean, thank you for that. Um, 
So there's a lot more to strategy than uh, than meets the eye, but it's it's great to have inside that pillar of strategy that you've got so many different areas to cover and um, in, in such a great order too. So thank you for sharing. Now let's talk about pillar two. Um, now we're sort of getting sort of focused here on the client experience or a bit more around the client and the, and the offering. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess we hear we hear that all the time, right? You know, having a strong value proposition, you know, is really yeah. important. But, um, you know, tell, tell us a little bit more around this client experience and value proposition part. Yeah. Okay. So, you do hear it a lot and it is important. But one thing I've, I've learned, we, we do a lot of surveys of clients. So, for, for our, our um, advice businesses that we work with, we survey their clients. And you know what? Most advisors are doing an awesome job in the eyes of their clients. So when we say have a good client value proposition, I don't think really there's anything broken that's, that needs fixing in terms of what advisors are doing for clients. But if you were to think of it to take it to the next level, right? To, so to go from a good advice proposition to a great one, where it should start is who is it actually for? So who's your client value proposition for? Is that specific enough? Because the more specific and clear you are on that, the more impactful your, the value you deliver can become. And actually, that'll feed through to a lot of your other business financial metrics as well. Um, so that's where I'd actually recommend starting. And then from there, there are ways that a firm can can tweak their value proposition to enhance it and, and raise advocacy and satisfaction, um, which we could touch on if you like. But yeah, look, it's there's very few advisors who are, who are doing a bad job, right? That people enter this industry with a, a lot of passion. So it's more about enhancing who it's for and, and making it more specific than, than fixing something. Yeah, fair enough. So you'd um, really want to try and chunk down on that ideal client or um, understanding mm. exactly who they are. Yep, the ideal client. Tell us about what firms have been doing in that in that space. Yeah, sure. So um, we use a concept called the bullseye ideal client. And, and what we're trying to get to there is that an ideal client, you might say, which, which clients do we take on? What the bullseye ideal client says is if there was one client that could walk through your door tomorrow, who would that look like? You know, and just one client. And that, that's your bullseye. You may take other clients on uh, adjacent to that, but let's get really clear on who that one client would be. And, you know, to answer your question, what, what are other businesses doing on that? One firm that's had incredible success and, and, and insane growth actually is so specific that they target not just executives, but C-suite executives that have really complicated executive share schemes in specific companies. So this advisor has learned the share schemes of certain companies so well that he knows how they work better than a lot of the staff at those companies. And so you can imagine those executives talking to each other saying, this person absolutely just (laughs) sorted it all out for me, made it really clear. You have to see them. You have to go and see them, right? They even do seminars at those companies to educate their executives on their own system, if you can believe that. So that's an example of a bullseye client, you know. There's probably, uh, you know, 500 to 1,000 people that fall into that definition of a, of a bullseye ideal client. Now, you know, not every business has to get that specific, but the question that everyone should ask is, are we specific as we should be? Yep, 100%. Now, and if advisors that are listening to this, uh, podcast haven't yet clearly defined what their ideal client is, where, where can they start? So if you think about what, you know, the different attributes of a client, you've got demographics like geography, income, age, uh, you've got psychographics, you know, attitudes and beliefs, uh, you've got their needs, how, how complex are their needs, are you, you know, are you looking at a family office or are you looking at a mass affluent or something in between and you've got the financial impact to your business. So, what fees would they be paying? And how, so, if you were to lay out those kinds of dimensions and just try to pinpoint, you know, okay, we've got a minimum fee of two thousand dollars. Would we take a client that, to pay fifty thousand dollars? Probably not, because they're, they're going to have such complex needs that we'll be running around doing ad hoc, you know, first time advice. So there's probably a, a sweet spot in there. Maybe it's between seven thousand and twelve thousand. You know, where we. We deliver the client the most value. We make them the best profit margin, you know. And so, try to create. Just consider what that that band is for for those different dimensions. Is one way to do it. Yeah, fantastic. And and what are some of the other um, questions? I guess that um, advisors can be, you know, 
pose to themselves or to their staff when they're looking at their current or existing client base around, you know, who that client might be or who that, that bullseye client might be? Yeah, sure. So good question. So profitability is obviously an important one. So you might ask, do we have a target profit margin in the business? Say we're targeting a 35% EBIT. Okay. What percentage of our clients are we making that EBIT on? And what percentage of clients are deviate? You know, which, what percentage of clients are we making less than 15% EBIT on? And, and is there a good reason for that? In other words, it's a kind of a tail analysis. Um, you might also ask, how many of our ideal clients are there in Australia? You know, if there's, if there's 10 million people that fit our ideal client, it's probably not specific enough. Also, you know, are we clear on which clients we say no to? And not, not only am I clear on it as the business owner, but is everyone in my business clear on it? And how do we actually do that? How do, how do we say no in a way that still takes care of that client? You know, are we, are we clear on our fee schedule? Is there any discounting going on? Are we consistent with that? We, do we feel like we're doing low value work? Like, am I, do I feel like I'm bogged down in work that I'm not really, it's not delivering value to me and I'm not really delivering value to someone doing that work? So that those, the question, the answers to those questions can guide, you know, whether you might have a problem there or you an opportunity to, to focus more. You know, a lot of a lot of um, advisors listening to this will be at different stages of their business. Some some people will have you know a young and new client base that they've just created a business or they're thinking about getting into business. Um, mm. Others will have you know more established businesses, and as you mentioned, that tail concept comes into it. Um, so the idea of then finding your niche client, finding your bullseye client. And then thinking about how that fits with the client base and then working out how are we going to transition this existing business um, into this, you know, business where we just look after our niche clients. Yeah, that, that's a real challenge. <laughs> that's, so if you're starting out, you, you're just trying to grow the business and get revenue and win new clients. I guess the, the practical side of that is consciously have a plan to make that transition. So what, what is your desirable ideal client? And what's your plan to get there? What, what will you do with clients that don't fit that, that profile and start mapping it out? Make it part of your quarterly strategic rhythm so that you don't turn around in four years and find yourself with, you know, a hundred clients that aren't actually profitable and, and neither of you are really helping each other. In terms of the, what those solutions actually look like, um, you know, you might, if you're growing rapidly, you might have junior advisors that you pass those clients on to. You might refer them on to a, another business who, who look after those types of clients. So there are, you know, there are different ways to, to find that. We, I've, I've seen an advisor whose goal is always to, to be lifting the, the investable assets of his ideal client every year. And he'll bring on associates to, to take the next, the, uh, the previous cohort. And that's worked quite well for him. Yep. So, uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've got our, our bullseye client. There's a, there's a fair few questions that you've mentioned that are a great starting point to be able to, uh, ask yourself and then come up with that ideal client and, and document it and write it down and work out who you are going to say yes and no to. Um, once you've worked that out though, what, what's the next step in, in the process with, um, with Pillar 2? Yeah, so it's all about really understanding them and then and delivering to their needs. So how well do you understand them? You know, is it, that, that example I mentioned earlier of the, the advisor looking after executives, he really understands them, right? At least that, that part of their, their experience. So immerse yourself in their world. You know, if it, if they're part of associations or industry associations or, you know, whatever it is, just try to become an expert in their world and deeply understand their needs, but also get direct feedback from them. So whether it's feedback surveys from clients, interviews, just open discussions, really start to deeply understand them. And then you can start to shape what you do around that, you know, um, and that's where refreshing your value proposition kind of comes into play. Now we know who it's for. We know what their needs are. What might be change up with what we do to so it resonates even better. Yep, I feel like you were very polite there. You didn't say we need to find out what all the uh, all the clients' pain pains are and the things that are keeping them away at night and all the emotional aspects uh, as well, which uh, often uh, planners would be thinking about. You know, if, when it comes to you know how do we best serve these particular people, we need to figure out what they're um, what's keeping them awake at night. Absolutely. As we go as we go through this, and I've heard you talk about the features and benefits method. Can do you want to explain that to the listeners? Oh yeah, sure. So this is just a very simple framework comes from the land of marketing and so on. But, you know, if you if you were to decide, yes, we want to refresh our CVP, we've got a really clear articulation of 
who it's for, how do you actually do that? If you map out the features of what you want to offer them, so features of what you do or provide, and then the benefits are the benefit that the client gets from that, it's just an easy way to provide structure around this. right? So in that earlier example, a feature is we deeply understand the challenging uh, share schemes that you need to take part in. And we are the best experts in Melbourne to solve that. And we also provide XYZ, which we know that they, they really love. Benefits to you are, you know, you're not missing out on opportunities. You're getting the optimal outcome. You don't have to worry about it. You know, you can sleep easy. Um, you're making the most of your, your income. And so that's what the features benefit thing looks like. And, and that's an example of one that's quite specific to that client. You know, it's not just, oh, we help you with your goals and that gives you confidence. You know, now, now that can be good, but how can you, how can you re- refine that to make it um, more tailored to your ideal client. You probably need to consider as well some, some proof points. So how, how do we prove that that's real? Okay. So we've got our features and our benefits, but day to day, what are we doing that backs that up? You know, so that it's not just a marketing spiel. So, and document all of that. Yeah. It, it is kind of a marketing spiel, but it's also, I think it's really important too. And I love, I love the saying that people don't buy uh, your products or what you sell, they buy a better version of themselves. Uh, and that's obviously when you're talking about, you know, the benefit and, 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 you know, not just the financial benefit, but the emotional benefit and the, um, around that as well. So understanding what, what the, your products, what you deliver, the advice you deliver and, um, and the benefit, uh, the better version of the client. Um, love it. Love it. Let's get practical here. How can ad- advisors really start to get down, um, and implement this sort of stuff? So if you've got your features and benefits mapped out and you want, you do want to tweak those, you know, there's a couple of schools of thought as to how you make those changes. Agile is all the rage, you know, ever since it exploded out of Silicon Valley. Basically, it's just testing and learning. So try things, experiment with your clients, get the feedback, see how it went, and then adjust as you go. That system is really good for any project or change where the outcome is uncertain, right? So if there's high uncertainty, take a test and learn approach. So just try the feature. You know, when you do your features and benefits, some of them will be aspirational. You won't have them yet. So just try it out, see if there's value to being delivered and, and iterate. For projects that are a bit where there's more certainty, so say you're, say you're just moving office locations, you don't need to test and learn with that, right? You just need a plan. Um, so there's, the mistake some business leaders make is they, they think everything is like an office move. You know, we'll, we'll do the, six month plan, we'll put the budget, we'll put each task and Bob's your uncle. Um, so with, especially with client experience stuff, you, you, you want to just get a temperature check as to how it's going. Um, so rather than locking something in and doing a huge launch, um, testing and learning is just a good, good way to do it, you know, not over invest. It certainly is. It's the, uh, it's the, you know, the, the, the create something small, try it, ask, ask a few, uh, clients for their feedback, you know, reiterate, work out what they might be uh, and deliver exactly what your clients are after rather than what you think they might be after. Yeah, spot on. Wonderful. Now, um, uh, I'm, uh, I probably should ask you about human-centred design, the methodology too, because I think, uh, I, think uh, I like talking to you about that as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, so there, there's another buzzword that came out of Silicon Valley. You can kind of think of the client experience as something – slightly separate from the client value proposition. So they, they're interlinked. So the value proposition is, is all those benefits that the client gets from dealing with you. Um, so, you know, when, when they're at home sleep, going to bed at night and they feel secure and happy because they're, you know, they've got financial freedom, that's the value proposition being delivered. How about when they walk into your office? How do they feel when they walk into your office? How do they feel when they get communications from you? How do they feel when work is in progress and... You know, where, that, are they clear on where things are up to? So you could consider that the client experience and, and a tool for that is just a client journey map, right? A lot of businesses have done this. You just map out the client's experience with you from end to end and what are the emotional high points and low points? Where's the friction? So that's another thing that you could add to your value proposition to increase advocacy and, and sort of the delight that clients have in dealing with you. And they can work in tandem, you know. The thing is with client experience is you, you want to align your efforts with what's really important to clients. So what I mean by that is some, some businesses I've seen bend over backwards to try and shorten their SOA production time. 
from six weeks to four weeks or from four weeks to three weeks. Actually, clients don't care about that when we ask them. What they care about is knowing where it's up to along the way. So they'd rather not be updated and have confidence over six weeks than to hear nothing and then have it done in four weeks, right? So, um, and that's just an example from surveys we've done in the past. It, you know, I'm not saying that's the case for every single client, but make sure that what you're putting all that effort into is actually valued by the client. Um, and will improve their experience. The best way to do that is to ask them. Yeah, exactly right. And I love I love the idea of a client journey map. And and I always think about these memorable moments as well. So sometimes a memorable moment is something great happened, as you, as you mentioned, the word delight, surprise and delight or delight. That was an amazing process. Uh, that's what I remember. But sometimes it could be, like you just said, you know, waiting for an SOA and not being um, kept up to date. So sometimes that uh, memorable moment might be a negative memorable moment that you're trying to remove from the map. Spot on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Those little moments of delight can have a huge impact. I've heard great stories like um, uh, an advisor that comes out with um, their more el- elderly clients and, and tests their tire pressure on their way out or having a, a name card in the car park to welcome them as they're arriving. You know, little personalized touches like that can, can go a long way as well, especially if they're easy. Incredible. Yeah, exactly right. Now, um, speaking of marketing, I'm pretty passionate about, uh, you know, you know, marketing and, um, and in my head, uh, if an advisor is doing an amazing job um, and they've got all this set up and they've got their client um, journey map and there's lots of memorable moments, um, then, then surely the next step in this process is to promote it or talk about it? Yeah. And actually, um, in my experience, Fraser, that's, that's the bigger opportunity for most firms than actually refreshing their CVP. So the CVP is really important. Ideal clients really important. But I've found that advisors are quite humble in nature. They want to deliver value. And so what it comes down to is, are you converting all of that advocacy that you're generating from clients into growth for your business? In one of our surveys, we we measure um, what's called the referral gap. So a, a lot of clients say, I'm totally delighted with my advisor. I'm highly likely to recommend them to friends and family like nine or 10 out of 10, but I'm not doing it. I'm not referring them, right? And so there's a percentage of of clients. I think the average is about 15% of clients are raving advocates, but they're not actually raving advocates. (laughs) So what we would recommend is you, if that's the case for you, you, you've got a latent growth opportunity in your client base. You're already doing a wonderful job. Your CVP is already proven with those clients. How are you going to convert that into growth in a way that suits your culture? And what it comes down to often is asking for referrals in some form or another. It doesn't have to be as blunt as that, yep. but it's attracting new introductions, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's essentially, it's converting that advocacy that you've earned through a lot of hard work and trust into helping more clients and growing your business. And so that's, that's actually going a bit into the pillar three growth stuff. But, you know, most, most new clients come to advice businesses through referral. As everyone would, you know, listening to this podcast would know, uh, and there's a greater opportunity there which most advisors aren't tapping into. Yep, absolutely. It's certainly a big part of it that uh, successful firms are doing, as you would see. Um, now we, we we sort of talked about that, you know, the CVP, but um, I guess this is not necessarily a set and forget that these sort of things will c- continually change over time. Yeah, yeah. Just like the strategy, it's worth it's worth revisiting over time. You know, that the landscape's changing. Uh, there's, there's an increase of integrated advice, you know, so the increasingly business will, will get good at integrating accounting and wealth, for example. So if you offer both of those services, you will need to iterate how you integrate them. If you don't offer them, you'll need to consider how you're competing with those businesses. And it may look like you need to cooperate more closely with with other service providers or become a central advice hub. So they're just, that's just one example of how things will change over time. And so just like the rest of a business's strategy, it's worth revisiting it from time to time. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, um, so I guess if I just quickly summarize pillar two of my, from my notes here, it's obviously defining the market, um, understanding who you best serve from an advisor point of view, um, working out exactly um what you're going to be able to offer them um, c- consistently and, and regularly, uh, weighing up the features and benefits, really important, mapping it out, looking at your memorable moments, um, obviously putting it in place is pretty important. And, and as you mentioned in the previous pillar, uh, you know, making sure that your your staff are coming along the journey with you. 
Uh, and then, of course, the, the part that I love about telling the world about it, uh, the marketing part of it. Um, and of course, uh, you know, asking your clients to help you uh, change over time and, and, you know, at that point that asking your clients if they're loving it to, you know, how can they bring other people in is a, is a skill in itself. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, tell us a little bit more about, um, and obviously thanks you thanks to the Macquarie Virtual Advisor Network too for sharing all these insights and creating these these pillars. How can advisors that listen to us find out more about, uh, about, about Van? Yeah, look, we would be delighted to, to talk to any of you listening. Um, you can just Google Macquarie Van or head to macquarie.com.au forward slash van uh, or speak to your local Macquarie BDM. Uh, basically, we, we run for businesses of up to about five or six million dollars revenue. We run a program which is 18 months in length and is with peers in a, in a group. So they might be in the same state or a national group. Uh, because we find that sharing element is really important. And then, you know, experts from Macquarie, but also outside Macquarie play a role in, in delivering the content. So yeah, if you'd like to know more, please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. Thank you. And of course, we've sort of covered pillar one and pillar two today. I'd, I'd, I'd love it if we could come back one other time and cover the other two pillars. We'll have to pencil that in as a, as a possible thing. So uh, hopefully um, we can do that one day. Uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing that. Some, uh, like you said, ten years worth of experiences watching these amazing firms develop, uh, and of course, other ones that don't develop as fast. So, you know, getting the learnings from both what worked and what didn't work. So, uh, really appreciate you sharing today. Uh, thank you so much. Pleasure, Fraser. Thanks for having me. And one of the things, of course, um, you know, there, you know, we mentioned today in this pillar, there is a bit of a guide out there as well. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this pillar two um, sort of domain, if you go to macquarie.com.au forward slash client hyphen experience, some of what we've talked about is, is kind of laid out there in a simple structure. Fantastic. You've, uh, you've mentioned a lot of resources today. Um, Sean, really appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll put all those resources and links. Um, so if you're looking at this on, uh, on the XY website, you might be able to find access to all those links. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks, Fraser.